Jonathan, my man, how you doing? Welcome to the Block Hash Podcast. Live, happy to have you on. What's up? Thanks, Brandon. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. Um, so cool. So there's a, there's a bunch of things I want to ask you and I want to dive into, including around DAG Labs and some things you've worked on in the past and what you're doing now. Um, so, but first, before we do that, tell me a little bit about yourself and your backstory. How did you, how did you find yourself, you know, getting into the space, um, and into crypto and blockchain? Um, was there like a particular reason? Um, how did you kind of navigate there in life? Wow. Um, so I started my uh, computer science degree, a graduate degree around 2013, 14. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just had to choose a project, you know, a lab project. And uh, my my advisor, Aviv Zohar, he, he suggested Bitcoin. It took me uh, quite a while to be convinced that it's um, that it's interesting. I kind of uh, was unsure. But once we got into this topic, it was really, really interesting. Very, very basic research in the sense that you're, you get to explore um, very fundamental questions about this system, why it, why Nakamoto consensus is designed this way. At that mm -hmm. time, there were only like two white, two papers basically on, on Bitcoin. There was Satoshi's paper and Aviv's paper on, on Red Balloons. So once so the, the, the lab project became uh, um, later the Ghost Protocol paper. And about a year later, Vitalik put the uh, Ghost on the map in the Ethereum white paper. And this kind of gained traction to our research and let me motivated uh, me and, and Aviv to explore other protocols and other mechanisms to accelerate the block creation rate and scalability. Yeah, what are these papers that you worked on? You mentioned Ghost Protocol. Um, were there others as well? Yeah, so Ghost was uh, an alternative chain selection tree uh, rule. We can get to that later. Mm -hmm. We had inclusive blockchain protocols, which is more close to what Ethereum ended up implementing. Mm -hmm. It's the first DAG paper, first paper that uh, suggested a, a DAG structure for the blockchain. Mm -hmm. Then we had Spectre, which I presented in Scaling Bitcoin Hong Kong. I believe it was 2016, which was the first chainless DAG protocol. We basically got rid of the notion of a chain and just ordered blocks according to their position in the DAG, in the DAG structure. Later, I think 2018, we improved upon the property of the Spectre with a new protocol, which is unsimilar. And uh, its name is Phantom and later Ghost DAG. Mm -hmm. And now I'm working on another new protocol, but I can't yet uh, you know, give a spoiler, but okay. the line of research is continuing. Gotcha, gotcha. Is is this new one? You don't have to give too much of a spoiler, but is it along the same lines, or is it covering like something different? It's along the same lines. What you basically want to do is you want to alleviate and remove as many assumptions on the network as possible, so that when you launch your network, you're not hard coding into the Genesis block too many mm -hmm. assumptions on the network. So with Phantom, we alleviated. We alleviate basically the order of things. You first decide the throughput, and only then you hard code the parameter. In contrast to Satoshi's protocol, in this new protocol, we are we have managed to get rid of this. So we are not assuming anything on the latency inside the Genesis block. Of course, the client does need to have some estimate of the recent network latency, which is pretty reasonable and you know, impossible to avoid. Gotcha, gotcha. Where where are you based? Where are you from? So I'm Israeli. I'm I'm, uh, I'm I've been born here, um, mm -hmm. and um, I was in the Hebrew University. Uh, this is where the the computer science uh, degree um, took place. I received my PhD from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and Dag Labs is based in Tel Aviv, and uh, recently starting. Uh, Last May, this May, I started a postdoc at Harvard University. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, with COVID conditions, it's remote, but you know we'll see. Looking forward to visit there as well. Gotcha. Um, what, what's the postdoc at, at Harvard? Is it you know along the same lines as this as well, or um, in different field? Um, I would say in between. It's uh, more 
focused on the application layer mm -hmm. and the dynamics of transaction ordering incentives of different uh, players. Basically what happened in the space is that the focus has shifted slightly from scaling the infrastructure to, to you know, playing with the dynamics of transactions, front running, who gets to order transactions, at what cost, um, who's, who can collude with who, uh, who's the intermediary layer. Mm -hmm. And these things are not separated from the infrastructure construction, but they also have a different, I would say, different research tools and different research mindsets. So this is what me and others in the Harvard group are focused on. Okay, so you guys do a lot of development and um, um, trying out different concepts and stuff at, at Harvard, you know, with these tools and with the things that they have. All right, is it the, does Harvard have like a community like based around blockchain there? Or do they have a, a lot of support for their students that want to learn more about it and to like dive into it? Um, I'm kind of new in Harvard, so, okay. and I'm also remote. So okay. I'll, 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 I'll answer this within a few months, we can re-meet. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, I, I've seen some stuff in the past. I'm, I'm just kind of curious if they've um, really tried to foster that kind of environment there. I'm sure well, they have. They definitely degree. are, and they have published um, both pa papers on, for instance, one paper by Professor David Parks and Daniel is about, um, and you know, and other co-authors is about counter double spend attacks. Okay. which is very interesting. It's, it's looking at a, at a reorg event when someone 51% uh, attacks the network mm -hmm. and they analyze what happens when the minority wants to counterattack and, and re remain and prevail with their shorter chain, with a temporary shorter chain. So this is one paper that came out of this group. Uh, another paper was, a shorter paper was a correction to Ethereum 2.0 um, consensus protocol. So definitely there's um, lots of interest in that specific, in, you know, in this particular group in crypto. And we're looking forward to get, you know, other students and many, many um, collaborations as possible. Very cool. Very cool. Um, yeah. So let, let's talk about DAG Labs too a little bit. Um, I'm curious to, you know, what is exactly and then how, um, you know, that's, that's made it an impact on the space and what you guys are, you know, currently doing. So. Um, I guess uh, to start off, what is it exactly and what's the overall goal and mission? Uh, yeah, so the goal and mission have changed with the time and with the development of the field. Mm -hmm. I guess it started around 2017 with the attempt basically to develop the, the DAG into a separate cryptocurrency proof of work base. Mm -hmm. It was um, very timely at at two, 2017 at that time. Mm -hmm. And we were basically trying and to, to, to a great extent still trying to push the limits of uh, Nakamoto consensus, meaning we stick with a proof of work model of block creation of transaction fees of miners, full nodes. We stick to that model, but replace the longest chain rule, which is quite constraining with a much more complicated, but, um, flexible ordering protocol, which allows many, many miners to, which, which allows miners to create many, many blocks in parallel. So I would say it's basically shifting the mining from a sequential paradigm to a parallel paradigm. Mm -hmm. And this was the main, the main, I would say positioning 2017, 2018. In the, in the recent years with the great success of Ethereum, I kind of realized that we should be more of a, a eco player in the ecosystem of Ethereum rather than a separate standalone product. So we are optimizing the network to order transactions in the Ethereum and DeFi ecosystem rather than trying to to um, I you know to create another isolated network. If that makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. Why why the focus on Ethereum um, versus any, another blockchain out there? Is it just the fact that it's you know got the biggest you know community and user base right now um, for all the protocols, I guess, or is there another reason? So I would say that, I would say it's twofold. One is it's it's targeting the more general DeFi ecosystem, mm -hmm. and to the extent that Ethereum is its current center, then if you should focus on Ethereum if you want to impact that field. 
this is by far the most interesting development in, in crypto. There's, you know, in Bitcoin and other other alternative coins, there's the development and innovation is much slower and, and much less dramatic. So mm -hmm. this is one this is one reason. The other reason is with Ethereum shifting to layer two, it seems that Ethereum is undergoing a fragmentation event where anyways users and and uh, developers will need to migrate to you know siloed areas unfortunately but this is this is this will happen um, um this way or another so i would say this is both this is an opportunity for for us to impact and to to provide the product with you know to users that are anyways considering which l2 or which side chain to migrate to Okay, you yeah, you mentioned DeFi too. How are you guys trying to make an impact on on DeFi? And that's a space everyone wants to get into. I have so many conversations about it. Yeah. Um, so the the DeFi stack is you know has multiple layers, mm -hmm. and we are focusing on the infrastructure layer, meaning the the transaction sequencing layer. Mm -hmm. So without considering the logic of transactions just yet. Without considering how to handle the state, how to prove the the, um, the validity of the state, etc., you know how to create interesting uh, versions of of Uniswap or or other kinds of protocols. We are focusing on who gets to order transactions, what's the performance of this layer, and what's the trust assumptions of this layer. So imagine you're a, you're a wallet for for DeFi users, and you need to tell the users, okay. Um, I will give you, you know, you want, you want to siphon basically a user base or to, to, to provide your users with, with good service. So you need to provide them with several metrics and, and several, um, you know, you need to, to decide how to optimize the user's experience. Mm -hmm. Now, as I said, with the fragmentation of Ethereum, you will need, you will need to choose who, who orders the transactions. You can decide to wait for the main chain to order the transaction. You can decide that the roll-up operator will will order your transaction, and you can decide that um, Caspa sidechain will will order the transaction. And there's different trade-offs to these different um, choices. And our focus is to to be this you know to be a prominent sequencer for for DeFi users. And practically, this means that the wallet will hopefully send the transactions through our service. Our service will order the transactions and will, you know, communicate with the Ethereum main chain in a more limited manner, so mm -hmm. as to, you know, to utilize the scalability of our system and the performance. Of it. Okay, I, I get that. Um, okay, so how does that optimize the user experience? Like at the at the end um, for the end user at the surface level, how does that you know affect them? You know, in DeFi when they're using you know these these different projects. Um, Does it create like more efficiency or um, remove slippage or just uh, what is the main goal? So the angles are speed of confirmation. We are mm -hmm. aiming for instant confirmation. By instant, I mean that the protocol does not impose any latency that the internet, you know, over the, the natural latency of the internet. So mm -hmm. you ping, you know, like you like Google res results. You enter, you press enter, and you get it. So that's what we want. the The immediate, this immediate confirmation is very, very important. You know, I'm a very impatient person, so I, I hate to wait, <laughs> even for a few seconds. And right. And while there's there's discussion in the more, I would say, hardcore and foreign parts um, of the community between you know among researchers and and devs about the um, security implications of fast confirmations, which is a legit conversation, we can get into it. Um, um, there's still, from the user experience, it's a game changer that you get immediate confirmation, regardless mm -hmm. of the you know, theoretical security implications, which we can get into. So this is one aspect. Another aspect is the fees, which are, of course, something that's very essential for, you know, it's a, it's a hot topic, I, I'd say, uh, especially when you know, we're going out of the bull market and the bull market was felt mm -hmm. um, at a very, you know, it was very clear to everyone. And then and then another very important aspect is the manipulation resistance of the ordering. 
And there are, this is, I would say, the main thing that motivates our current design, which is we want to circumvent the public mempool. We want to ensure that miners um, cannot uh, collude in time and cannot extract the value from the user. And this requires a very fast block rate, let's say 10 blocks per second and more, in order for you know, these, time, these bots to, to be unable, both bots and miners, to be unable to front run users. Mm -hmm. So this involves um, some encryption tricks, uh, high, high, high block rate, I would say extreme block rate, Hopefully we'll get to 100 blocks per second, and then I, you know, then I'm good. The PhD has, you know, this is a practical st uh, stamp. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I guess so. To wrap up, speed, uh, fees, and manipulation resistance from the user experience perspective. Okay, I, I was having a conversation with the gal the other day, and we were talking about how bots, bots are really having a big effect in a negative way on on the DeFi space. Um, you know, whether you're trying to, you know, close a transaction or you're trying to find an arbitrage trade or, you know, whatever it is, they're, they're really saturating that space. Do you think it's an issue, like a, a really big issue or? Well, I'd say, you know, it's evidently a, uh, an issue, even if you talk to someone that's outside crypto, right? You ask mm -hmm. someone, what should the Wall Street backbone um, serve? What, how do you, what, what does a trader want to know about the Wall Street backbone? The trader wants to know that she gets immediate confirmation that the fees are pretty stable, and she wants to know that, the, that there's no one in the backbone, some IT guy that that's manipulating her transactions. Mm -hmm. So even if you if you just abstract away the um, the infrastructure and you ask someone from from traditional finance what's important in the network, you know he will say uh, enable, allowing bots to front run, you know, and, and sending your transaction to a public mempool before it's uh, you know, to a public uh, pool, just you know, in 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 general terms, to a public pool mm -hmm. before it gets it gets processed by the by the backbone, everyone agrees it's horrible. Got it, got it. Um, do you have a favorite DeFi project? Yeah, do you like Uniswaps and Pancake Swaps and and all the food ones and the sushi swaps, or do you have one that's uh? I like um, kosher sushi swap. <laughs> kosher kosher sushi swap. Yeah. And if there's no there's no such one, then you know let's let's build this. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a lot of different projects uh, in the space. Do you think any one or a couple in particular will probably um, you know grow the best over the coming years? I know it's like super super early, but um, I you know I guess teams and you know uh, developers you know, having the right developers having the right teams really play a big role in that. Um, it just feels like there's so many different. Um, DeFi protocols out there, it's hard to pick one. Um, and yeah. Do you have a couple you think will do better in the next coming years? Um, I wouldn't know. Um, mm -hmm. I would I would bet in the direction of which I haven't seen so far, at least not in um, not in um, in, in the central, you know, in the, in the leading uh, smart contracts. I would bet on contracts that allow for more expressive um preferences of the users for instance mm -hmm. and, and one one big thing is you know triggered execution the ability to say well i i want this transaction to be tr uh, triggered in 20 blocks if and only if these conditions happens happen these these kinds of expressive preferences are something that you know it's starting with with DeFi protocols mm -hmm. um allowing the user to to specify the, the allowed slippage and 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 similar things that you know there that uh, cover for the asynchronicity and the uncertainty of what happens with the transaction when it gets uh, actually mined, but but more generally allowing something that is that is allowing users to be much more general, much more expressive in the preference, any any smart contract or um, you know different infrastructure that allows this kind of of service. This would be, I think, a game changer. Got it. You also mentioned Caspa a little a little while ago as well. Uh, what is that exactly, too? Because I also saw it somewhere um, outside as well. Um, like, what is it? What is it exactly? What does it do? Um, yeah, Caspa, K-A-S-P-A. Yeah, Caspa. Um, 
Um, so Caspa is, is basically the name of the um, of the cryptocurrency or token that Dagwood is developing. It's the mm -hmm. token that um, is basically the engine or the gas of this this ordering this sequencing layer. Um, so Caspa stands for uh, you know it's in Aramaic it's silver or money in ancient Aramaic. Mm -hmm. So we kind of uh, thought it's a it's a nice name. We thought it's catchy. That's a cool name. Yeah. So. So, I mean, Casper already has a testnet, um, and we are trying to accelerate, you know, the block the block rate so it looks much more cool than one block per second. We just want Casper mm -hmm. to to look like a very, very, very extreme fast, uh, extreme block block DAG. Mm -hmm. We hope it will be cool, not only the name. Yeah. What, what's the goal for it? Is it to be something that's uh, transactional? Um, or something that just has a lot of utility within uh, DAG Labs and the stuff you're building out, and uh, have one of like those kind of tokens. It's basically the the token that that you use to auction the ordering in the sequence, you know, in the in the blocks. Okay. So yeah, it's, I would say it's just the gas or the or the au auction token. Okay. Um, I want to touch on one other thing, and then we'll we'll start um, wrapping it up a little bit. You mentioned the um, immediate confirmations. Doesn't that depend a whole lot on the liquidity that's you know available within um, any DeFi protocol at any given time to be able to fulfill something or confirm an order? Um, or is there, or does that really just go a lot deeper? Well, there's 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 several things that you can mean by confirmation. But mm -hmm. the most essential one is I get an instant confirmation that my transaction is valid, that it entered the sequence, the agreed sequence sequence of transactions, and that and what exactly its effect on the state is. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is because many, many suggestions to solve, so to speak, MEV and flashbots are are focusing are you know are using uh, um, encryption techniques and the problem with with general encryption techniques is you get a confirmation that your encrypted transaction was was included in the ledger but you don't get yet a confirmation that it was decrypted successfully in the ledger and in what and be, and what transactions preceded it so so to give you an example um th there are there are solutions that propose a time lock, time lock based encryption. So you put your transaction, then after after a few uh, blocks, miners are able to decrypt it and include the decryption, the decrypted version in the ledger. This doesn't really solve the problem because the user wants a confirmation that the decrypted version, that the ciphertext transaction was included and executed, not only that the, the, the encrypted form was, was included. So when I mean instant confirmation, I mean the user seeing that the transaction was included the user being able mm -hmm. to compute what's the new state of uh, uh, resulting from her transaction and to the extent that the smart contract itself requires some pending some liquidity you know some some other event then then the user you know will wait but the important part is that others can't front run the users the user um, you know, other developments can happen in that um, in that contract. So it's kind of a different layer, waiting for liquidity and waiter, waiting for transaction inclusion. Okay, understood. Cool. Um, so what what are the plans for DAG Labs? You know, the rest of 2021 in terms of um, you know things you got on the table that you guys are doing, or um, you know, key projects or dates or partnerships or whatever it may be that's um you know you consider public that you think people should you know be keeping an eye out for or should follow wow there, there are several um <laughs> the the base layer goals are to to stabilize the test net which is pretty stable for the last um weeks mm -hmm. and to try to accelerate it to 10 blocks per second my devs will will not like you know hearing this they want it to mm -hmm. be more robust than fast, but I really want to push it forward to 10 blocks per second. Then uh, design the MEV resistance feature, which involves encryption in, in a more sophisticated manner. This is uh, on the base layer. In terms of partnership, we are working on partnering with roll-up teams so that, the, so that they will direct their users', their, uh, users transactions 
to our sequencing service. Mm -hmm. So this is a partnership we are working on. And, and finally, something that's more research oriented, we are developing um, a platform for, I call it GameNet, which is basically allowing real, simulating real, uh, real world uh, competition between different miners to reorg the chain and attack it. So you can just consider um, a very, very profitable transaction, okay, the, a whale transaction. It's a, it's, a, it's a very, very profitable arbitrage. Everyone sees it, also the miners. So it was included in one block. And now you need to consider as a miner whether you want to accept that block or ignore it and try to attack it. So there are very interesting game theoretic um, dynamics that result from this. You know, all the miners see the same block. All the miners want to attack it. So what, what's the resulting dynamic? So this is both a research question, which, um, which I'm working on you know, in my research capacity, as well as an interesting game to play in, li in a live network. So this is something we are working on maybe more towards the summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it sounds like you guys got like a lot of stuff on the table that you're working on. So I'm sure you guys stay pretty busy, huh? Yeah. Um, do you, okay, one final question, then we'll wrap up. What are your thoughts on the overall, you know, market for crypto and for blockchain? Um, and it can be, you know, technical analysis and trading aside, um, you know, as a technology that's, you know, developing out and building infrastructure and becoming more and more commonplace. Um, where do you think it's at? Do you think it's at a healthy place where it's growing steadily still? Do you think it's got some some hurdles to get through? Obviously, there's been tons of different things floating around in the news cycles. Um, I guess, what's your overall opinion on it? Yeah. Um, so, in terms of in terms of the current time we are at, mm -hmm. so the, the bull market is not a very healthy environment for serious projects. Every you know every stupid NFT gets so much attention mm -hmm. and it's kind of hard to get, uh, to, to get traction when you are building something that's more robust and more thought through, which requires more cautious development rather than, you know, these NFTs, for instance. So the bull market, so the bull market, which, which seems to have ended is, was not a good period, was not a healthy period for, for such projects. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, necessarily, I don't necessarily want a bear market, but this kind of, of um, market of prices is, is more healthy and more, more a comfortable atmosphere for builders. Um, and it's not only my, my own sentiment. I, I, I talk with other founders and other builders, and it's, it's significantly um, easier to interact with people on meaningful features and meaningful research question, questions when, when the price is kind of steady and everyone is relaxed after they, you know, they had their buck. In terms of, of the future of crypto, I guess it really depends on, on, the, on what will happen with Ethereum's layer two, because there is, there is a scenario which I kind of, uh, I coined um, Ethereum supernova event, where everything is the, the every, every, everyone's attention is on Ethereum DeFi. And at the mm -hmm. same time, the main chain is not able to to process everything, so everyone goes to to L two and things become very fragmented, not only in terms of actual user experience, but also in terms of social consensus. Meaning, what 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 does a token on this rollup represent versus a token on that rollup? And you kind of can imagine one scenario where everything is is harmonious and things talk to one another. Mm -hmm. uh, tokens can be represented easily across platforms. But you can also imagine a scenario where just everything's everything falls apart in the sense that you have uh, every rollup, every rollup's token representation is a standalone standalone token and cannot be easily you know fungible over, uh, across other rollups. And if Ethereum will go undergo this supernova event, then then the community will not will no longer be centered around one layer. You know, although in terms of identity, you know, in social, social, um, um, you know, identifying as a as a defined Ethereum, 
it will be it will be more open to to other projects but in terms of actual usage and actual representation and actual exchanges uh, adoption this will be a very big event if if ethereum's uh, layer 2 is you know is is, fo is falling apart so i guess mm -hmm. we'll, we'll we'll know more in the next um 6 months um, that's what projects uh, roll up projects and other projects are estimating uh, to deliver and mm -hmm. Yeah, that's 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 basically what I'm looking for. Yeah, the the uh, closing to this year, the next six months will be very interesting to see how you know things shake out and what develops properly. And obviously, this, yeah, bull markets create a lot of distractions in the space. Um, you know, a lot of hype driven phenomena um, that really take away from the, the hard work and stuff being done at the surface level, uh, deeper beyond the surface level. So yeah, yeah I, I totally understand that sentiment. Um, how can people, you know, follow along um, with DAG Labs and what you guys are doing? Do you guys have social media? Do you have a blog? Or, or where should people go? Where would you direct them to? Um, you know, I will always uh, like to have more followers to my Twitter account, hashtag. Um, okay. There's a, Casper has a Discord um, channel where the community is basically organ uh, uh, synchronizing. Um, I guess there's even right now a community um, call, which I'm missing. Um, and there's a Discord channel. There's, I, I suppose there's a website. You know, we are, we're not very centralized. So each, each one has, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not totally in sync for what, what uh, website um, is developed by who. So there is, there should be a website. There is a GitHub. And we are definitely looking for contributors, open source contributors to, you know, to help up with the um, with this challenge i think people uh, new devs people that know um or want to get to know more how to how to crack the the inner workings of the system mm -hmm. will find this challenge um of accelerating the, the blockchain very very exciting just imagine taking a bitcoin like code and trying to get it to work with 100 blocks per second i i think it's it's uh, very exciting of course if you're an application dev then you'll be more uh, excited by the by the outcome of this, not necessarily by the development of this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That is exciting too. Um, I also, I heard Bitcoin had a new update recently too. Is that true? Oh, the Taproot update. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm not following closely whether you know it it it. it I, I, I wasn't after. either. I just saw I just saw a piece in the news cycle. Oh, Bitcoin had an update for the first time in years, and I'm like, it did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean. Not to not to downplay the importance of this for the Bitcoin mm -hmm. ecosystem, but uh, you know the innovation in Ethereum kind of kind of uh, shadows um, this the the incremental improvement in Bitcoin and Bitcoin's you know incremental and slow improvement improvement and, and development is kind of a feature that's you know the it's a, the the community is very conservative and uh, you know presumably this is what gives Bitcoin its value whether whether the value of Ethereum as an innovative platform will We'll flip that, you know. Time will yeah, tell. It, yeah, time will tell for sure. Um, that's probably a good place to wrap it up. Jonathan, thank you for coming on the podcast and making the time, um, you know, sharing your your knowledge and your backstory history with blockchain and everything you guys are doing with DAG Labs and uh, what you guys are doing in DeFi. A lot of cool stuff in there. I think a lot of people will appreciate hearing it. So again, thank you. Really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks a lot. And, and feel free to hop on the website. It's daglabs.com and to join the Twitter handle of daglabs. Um, you know, it's, we'll, we'll have some announcement there and, you know, we'll, we'll seek, uh, we'll get, um, we'll seek, um, uh, help over that channel as well. Perfect. Okay. We'll get all that stuff put into the, yeah, we'll put it all in the episode description and the video description as well as so people can easily access it so they can go check it out there. Yeah. Um, Perfect. Again, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it, man. Thanks for that, Brandon.